Hello, PTS students, faculty, alumni, and honored guests. I am so grateful to join you by way of this recording and for the opportunity to present a brief information session during alumni days. I'm also grateful to our director of alumni, the Reverend Carolyn Craston, for extending this invitation. My name is Renee Michael, PTS graduate class of 2010, ordained United Methodist clergy, serving in extension ministry as assistant to the bishop in the Western Pennsylvania Conference. I'm also serving PTS Alumni Council these past eight years. So why am I here? Well, my objective for our time together is information sharing. I'd like to share best practices based on my experience with facilitating clergy covenant groups these past five years. I believe all groups, whether students on campus, clergy groups, or ministeriums, seek community. They want a group to work with, to pray with, to learn with, to grow and speak with transparency. In other words, a safe space for sharing ideas and interests with like-minded people. And that's where covenant building communities come in. Maya Angela once said, when you learn, teach. When you get, give. This is an opportunity for me to give through sharing information. And so if you'd like to take notes, I invite you to um, grab your notepad and I invite you to prepare for that at this time. Okay, friends, let's begin to learn a little more about building covenant communities. I'd like to begin by um, offering these learning objectives. To provide you with an overview, to offer best practices and examples, and to offer a few questions to ponder. First question, what are covenant building communities? Well, these are small groups. These groups meet on a regular basis. They work together as a team. They work on similar concerns. They explore new ways of approaching topics of discussion, and they help each other work through a particular set of circumstances. Now, the team typically evolves into all of these phases. We all know how awkward it can be to initiate a team, but as you foster trust, as you learn more about each other, as you establish safe space, these dynamics always play out within the time frame that the team is meeting. These, as I mentioned, are small groups. They're groups of eight to 10 people along with the facilitator and they offer a few hours of their time each month. And, and that's important to remember, there is a commitment of time and you should be there for the duration from beginning to end. You come to learn more about a particular area of shared interest or concern, and that could vary. Now, if I were to talk about the five years that I've been a facilitator, it's been about clergy covenant groups and those issues, those concerns that are of most importance to clergies as they are serving their congregations, whether they have been clergy for a number of years or, met or, or if they are new to um, the, the um, pastoral ministry. Another aspect of covenant communities is that they are informal small groups. They focus on growing together as they interact and gather wisdom. And so no one comes to this group with any expectations of being experts in anything. Everyone is starting at the same level. Everyone is just wanting to grow. That pressure of having to perform is not there. You have an opportunity to just get away, be yourself and enjoy. One other aspect I, I would mention is that you're gathering wisdom 
from the perspectives of others, whether those others are internal or external to the group. Because every once in a while, you may end up with someone who has had decades of experience in a particular area, and it would be beneficial to, to learn from that person. Now, what covenant communities are not, they are not clinical counseling sessions. And so it's just like having your friend diagnose your illness and that person is not a medical doctor. You might be a little leery about taking advice. So there is no clinical counseling going on here. They are not subject matter experts. No one is coming in to showcase what they know. They're coming in to learn. They're coming in to grow. And they are not pressure groups. They're not forming um, advocacy on any issue. They're simply coming, retreating, learning, breathing, supporting. And what I like to say is just be, just be. So we've talked a little bit about covenant or you've heard about it many times as I, I mentioned what these groups are all about. What you should know about covenant is that each covenant is, a, is unique to the group. It's unique to the group. It's unique to the subject matter of that group. It's unique to the personalities of that group and to their collective expectation. And so when this covenant is formed, it's developed and it's signed by all members. And this is something that you typically want to be in place by the second meeting. Um, because it is a means of accountability. And so if you have someone in your group who says, I value being on time, I value starting and ending on time, this is a sacrifice for me once a month. And it's very important that it plays out that way. And if you're not doing this from the very beginning, you may end up with one person who um, may second guess whether or not they can continue with the covenant group. So here, here's an example of um, a covenant format. You probably want to begin with purpose. You know, that's very important because that's your benchmark. It's also a means of keeping you on track. And it's a means of asking everyone else, reminding them of what you agreed to from the very beginning so that there are no misunderstandings expectations and accountability. And as I mentioned, it's gonna be based on the individual personalities in the room. But here are some examples. Start and finish on time, be prepared by reading or reflecting, um, maintain confidentiality, expectations that we can hold each other accountable to at any point if someone veers off Course. And of course, we always speak the truth in love. Relationship. These are relationship building. Share with respect and listen with respect. Maintain a judgment-free zone. Provide support in part by praying. And always remember that all voices are valued. So, you know, respecting and listening with respect is very important because everyone comes with a different perspective. Everyone comes with a different experience. When we begin to respect those things about individuals, then we value them and we demonstrate our value for them. So who, here are some tips. Be sensitive to different styles, different communications, different opinions. Listen to hear, not to respond. And we all know how that is. Someone says something, it resonates, it reminds you of something that you've done or heard or thought about, and you're thinking about how can I respond to what that person just said? We are really vibing here. But listen to hear is more important than any response that we may have. 
as respecting the other person. Examine our own assumptions and perceptions. You know, we, um, based on our individual backgrounds, we have very different assumptions and perceptions about things. And so before we begin to respond based on our own understanding, we should sit back and say, maybe I need to um, examine my perceptions now and, and, and allow this to play out. Let's hear where this is going or what God is wanting us to learn from each other. Keep confidentiality within the group. You know, that's very self-explanatory. There's nothing worse than establishing trust, establishing community, um, feeling so transparent that you can share your heart only to hear what you have shared um, outside of, find its way outside of the group at some point. So confidentiality within the group is a must. Remember, there are no winners or losers. This is not a competition. You know, hopefully this, everyone is here for all the right reasons. And, and that's just to establish community. Respect each other's views. Participate fully and be willing to share. You may think that you have nothing to contribute to a particular conversation, but you never know who may be waiting to hear what you have to offer. And above all, in all things, we pray. Pray for each other. We pray without ceasing in every situation. So let's talk a little bit about meetings. I mentioned that there are regular meetings. And so you meet over the course of a year, typically nine months, because you wanna take into consideration holidays and finals and, you know, just busy periods in, in, in your life. And so August through May is an example that we have followed in the past, but, you know, that should be something, again, that your group determines will work best for the people in your particular affinity group. The date and the meeting location is, um, is up to the facilitator. And one month could serve as a break at the discretion of the facilitator. But, you know, typically everyone is working as a team and those decisions are easy to come by. The group is responsible for establishing the schedule, the attendance, prioritizing dates and times as agreed upon at the beginning. And so, you know, it's not a one size fit all. Typically when um, I begin a new group, the very first thing we attend to is our calendaring. And so we may say, hey, how about the first Monday of the month? And someone says, no, you know, that is really not going to work. And so then you have to just come in all together, pull your calendars out, find something that is going to work the majority of the time and know that there can be flexibility with scheduling. It's all about teamwork. The other thing that we've learned since the pandemic is that groups may opt for in-person, virtual, or an agreed upon hybrid model. And uh, that has really served to um, provide support for the clergy groups that I've been facilitating because it meant that the pandemic, which was a very anxious, provoking time, did not prevent people from coming together and coming together in a safe environment. So now let's think about key practices and core values. Covenanting can create a community of trust. Um, trust is of the utmost importance. You know, one of the things that you don't want to do is go around and gather a bunch of people and say, hey, let's be part of a group. You want to make room for yourself to grow by inviting people who you may not know. 
And when you come together with groups of people that you don't necessarily know, what is foundational to the group and the success of the group is establishing a, a sense of trust. And trust takes time. Trust is given. It, it doesn't happen automatically. But that is a core value for groups as they're meeting. You want to reflect and respect the agency of adult learners. You know, we're, we're all adults. We all have our life experiences. And, you know, re respect that. Reflect on what they're sharing from their heart, even if it has not become part of your reality, even if it's not part of your experience. Um, there is just such value in learning from each other. And that, that goes down to um, the honoring the wisdom in the room. You know, sometimes that wisdom is out there for all to see and some wisdom um, creeps up before you ever realize it. Someone says something and it is just a rhema word from God and it is a, an opportunity for everyone to learn new perspective. Cultivate a sense of shared ministry and accountability. Ask questions rather than offering advice. And we always leave room for God's spirit to move among us. So here's a typical meeting format. There's always prayer. Always prayer at the beginning. Always prayer during, depending on, on what's happening, the dynamics of the group. And always ending in prayer and um, praying safe passage um, between times that we are together and the times that we are apart. Sometimes there's a brief devotion, sometimes both. Um, checking in with each person, that's part of the format. Giving time. And, you know, if you have 10 people, and you want to give a 30-minute segment to checking in, then make sure that each person has at least three minutes to share how things are going with them in their life. There will always be a regular topic for discussion and a time for reflection on that topic. You know, um, it could be current events. It, it could be a book that you're reading or a podcast or whatever the assignment is. The, the facilitator is responsible for providing a list and letting you know in advance what materials you'll need for the next meeting. And so, you know, for the meeting, your job is to be prepared for whatever you agree to, to study that particular month. Offer wisdom or support for group members as requested. You know, there are times when people will say, I, I need support. There are times when you just sense that that person needs a prayer and you can ask, hey, may I pray for you? May I pray about this situation? That's all part of covenant building and, and group dynamics. Always, always allow space for deep listening. You know, um, listening is, is so important. If you listen deeply, then sometimes you're able to identify the subtext. Um, sometimes the things that are, are expressed are not um, at the root of what the person is saying. And so you, if you listen deeply, then you can ask clarifying questions. If you ask clarifying questions, then you can help that person um, communicate what they want the group to consider. At the end of each meeting, um, if there is time, you know, one of the things that I've noticed about these meetings is the more in relationship we become, the more sharing we have, the more challenging it is to ensure that everyone has enough time to share. You may begin thinking this is a lot of time 
um, that we've dedicated to this meeting. But as you begin to um, have the dynamic of, of being friends with each other, learning each other, um, time really flies. So try to make time to consider any insights that you gained while you, while you were together and questions that you may want to ponder because the beauty of this information age is that you can text them to the group, you can text them to individuals, you can send an email, or you can make a phone call to the facilitator if you want. But um, make the most of that meeting and don't just let um, the insights go um, without further uh, reflection. So I've mentioned that there are facilitators of which I was one. And, you know, one of the things is I was invited as a facilitator five years ago. It was based on what people discerned about what I might bring to the table. Um, it was also based on a willingness to um, engage in this ministry. And it truly is a ministry. Um, and it was um, based on a willingness to learn because there, there is training. Um, there is, there's nothing haphazard about the way that a facilitator would lead a group. So there is foundational training. So um, facilitators are said to be good hosts. They're capable administrators, worship leaders, and planners. They don't act like an expert. They listen more than speak. They ask questions and invite conversation. They keep the covenant and hold the group accountable. They are peacemakers and they are dependable. They are teachers. And I would say that they also are charged with discerning um, what's happening in the room and helping to bring those things to the attention of the group, making sure that those people who won't necessarily um, speak up have an opportunity um, not to make them uncomfortable, but you want to create a space that creates that level of comfort that invites them to join in the conversation and also experience the best that this covenant group has to offer. The role of the participant. And again, I, I guess I can't express enough that sharing airtime you know, um, everybody has a lot that they want to share, but let's make sure that every person in the room has an opportunity to do the same because they are setting time aside just as everyone else. And they may come, you never know how excited they are based on whatever the reflection materials are that are given, but they want an opportunity to share their perspectives too. Um, the other role of the participant is to develop trust. Um, as I mentioned, trust is given. Trust is a process. And so we all have to be part of that process of developing trust. Develop learning practices. And so, you know, the role of the participant is to... Um, Oh, let's see, how can I say that? One of the things that you want to do as a participant is that you want to provide feedback. You want to um, extract as much useful information and bring it to the table. Um, you may think that it's redundant. Everyone is reading the same material or listening to the same podcast or watching the same YouTube or you know, prepared to discuss the same current event, but develop your own learning practices so that you may share and that it may be fruitful within the group. Because as I mentioned before, everyone comes with different perspectives based on their own unique identity. Participants should hold one another accountable. Um, if you Notice, for example, that um, someone is not um, attending to the covenant as everyone has agreed, speaking the truth in love. You may frame it as a question. Um, can we go back and look at our covenant this week? And can we um, look in particular at this particular um, item? 
I, I think it may be time for us to be more intentional about holding ourselves accountable to it. Speaking the truth in love, holding one another in prayer, always a, the best practice. And we all know that prayer changes things. Prayer comforts. Prayer is powerful. There's so much that we can say about prayer. And it's so important for us to hold each other in prayer, whether or not they've lifted a concern. You know, we, we are a prayerful group praying for each other, praying with each other. And authorize the facilitator. You know, um, take it easy. The facilitator is the messenger. And sometimes those messages, mess, messages are easy. And sometimes they may not be so easy, but authorize the facilitator to be the leader. They have been um, chosen for that particular role. And who knows when you may become the facilitator. Now, everyone who is considering participating in a covenant group should ask these two questions. What do you need the group to be and do in order to make an enthusiastic commitment to show up for every meeting? Enthusiastic commitment. That means that, you know, even on that day when you say, you know, I have a choice for this or that, or I don't know how I feel about it this month. Can you be enthusiastic about showing up for every meeting? That, that's a question that only you can answer. And what do you need the group to be or do in order to make a positive difference in your life, in your ministry, um, with a um, topic that is of importance to you? What do you need for them to do for, for that to happen? Um, it's always a give and take. And, uh, you know, you want to make sure that as you're given this time, you're, you're subscribing to a year, you're, you're subscribing to a certain amount of uh, months out of that year, and you are subscribing to a certain amount of hours out of that month. That is your time. And so you need to know um, what would cause me to choose this group and how much of a positive difference will it make after I have given all of this time and energy to attending this group. So, I want to prepare to close by um, giving some facilitator take, takeaways based on my past experience. Covenant groups, I believe, are transformative. I want to say that, you know, five years ago, I was part of an experiment. I was an experimental facilitator, and the people who chose to attend my group were part of the experiment as participants. And we basically just went with what we were given. We trusted the process and we believed that it was going to take us somewhere. We didn't quite know where, we didn't quite know why, and we didn't quite know if this would be a value or you know, if it was even good for us to, to dedicate so much time to a clergy covenant group. I can only speak for myself when I say it was transformative because when I received a group that was willing to come in and allow me to be the experimental facilitator, it actually caused me to feel less isolated it actually allowed an opportunity for me to connect with clergy that sometimes I only had an opportunity to speak with during our annual conference each year. And sure, we're Facebook friends. 
Sure, we we express our, our gratitude for each other and our care for each other, but there is nothing better than looking face to face. And, you know, that happens whether you're looking through the computer screen or you're around the table because you get the essence of a person's heart when you're in the same room with that person. You get to know a little bit more about them, especially as everyone begins to open up and, and share. And so after a year, it was very transformative. So transformative that I wanted other clergy to have an opportunity to have that experience. And that is really one of the reasons why I've been doing this uh, additional ministry. Um, the first, first Monday at one time it was, now I think it's the second Tuesday, you know, whatever works for everybody. But, you know, the other part of that dynamic is at the end of the year, being able to do an assessment and to um, see what has happened in, in the life of a person and walking closely with that person for an entire year. So in a nutshell, it is transformative. As I mentioned earlier, covenant groups reduce isolation. They truly do. I mean, when you come together with that group, you have 10 Sometimes for me, it's been 12, 13 people, and um, there is absolutely no way you can be isolated in a room of 13 people. Someone is going to pray something. Someone is going to say something. Someone is going to embrace you um, and your thoughts, your, your, um, your situation in ways that won't happen um, in isolation. And covenant groups strengthen relationships. They really do. Um, you know, if I, as I mentioned again, if I say a base number of 10 times five, that's 50 new friends, um, clergy friends that I have walked closely with in the course of five years. And so in closing, I would highly recommend um, these covenant groups that you consider how they may work in your space, how they may work in, in your context, and if they answer the two questions I listed above and, and maybe something that for, for you to consider. I want to thank you for your time. Carolyn, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to thank if any of my covenant group friends are there, those who have um, walked this, this walk with me the past five years. It has been such a blessing. And I pray that it will bless you also. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to mention if you have questions, my PTS email is rmichael at pts.edu.